Hi everyone, this lecture is going to be on diffraction, just keeping track of where we are in our objectives. Objectives 1 and 2 are not shown here, that's when the SL students taught the HL students the basics of waves. We have completed objective 3 completely up until this point and objective 5 completely up until this point. So the focus of today's lecture is going to be objective 4 specifically on diffraction. And we are going to start in on these two bullet points, but we're not going to fully understand them until next class. So let's go ahead and dive into refraction. I wanted to take a moment to kind of build on where we have been. So we've already talked about reflection. Reflection is a change in direction of waves when bouncing off of a barrier. You can think of reflection as being bouncing back. And we've already learned the law of reflection, which says the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. We have also investigated refraction. Refraction is the change in direction of waves when passing from one medium to another. You can think about it bending towards or away from the normal. And this is where Snell's law and our index of refraction comes in. Today, our focus is gonna shift to diffraction, diffraction. Diffraction is a change in the direction of waves when passing through an opening or around a barrier. Simply put, this is going to be when light or other waves is bending around obstacles. An example of diffraction, which I'm sure you have had experience with before, is if let's say there's a radio or a speaker that's around the corner from you, the sound waves diffract or bend around that corner and you can still hear that sound, even though you're not right in front of it. So in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to go to this website, http colon slash slash www.falstad.com slash ripple slash. And when you get to the website, you're going to see something like this. Towards the top, you can think of this as like a tank of water and towards the top, this is like a constant drip into that tank. There are some things that you can manipulate, such as the source frequency. You can increase that frequency or you can decrease that frequency. Another important thing that you can change here is that you can select different obstacles. I'm gonna have you investigate some of these now. So on that website, I'm going to ask that you investigate a single source, a half plane, an obstacle, a double slit, and a single slit. And each time I want you to think about what those wave fronts are looking like. I also want you to play with the frequency. What does increasing or decreasing the frequency do? As you go through this investigation, you should be jotting down some notes about some differences that you're observing. And then at the end, take a look at this summary question number six. We'll go over that together in just a moment. So pause the video, investigate, and play to check the summary. Checking your answers to the summary. When light diffracts, what happens? And again, I'm saying light, but we could really mean sound waves. We could really mean water waves. We're kind of grouping those all together. So when these waves diffract, what happens to the direction? Well, the direction is going to change. That's that bending effect that we're seeing. What happens to the wavelength, the frequency, and the speed? All of those are going to stay the same. The frequency does not change, the wavelength does not change, the speed does not change. I wanna take a moment to contrast this to refraction, which we saw before, where the wavelength and speed did change as it passes into a new medium. And finally, the amplitude of the wave is going to decrease. And that's where you can see in the simulation where it kind of got dimmer or less intense the farther away you go. It is important to note with diffraction that in order for diffraction to be noticeable, the size of the obstacle or the gap needs to be the same order of magnitude as the wavelength of that wave. So for example, the size of this little gap here needs to be on the same order of magnitude as the wavelength of this wave. A few other examples. 
And you can start to see some really interesting patterns forming, especially down here as it bends around this obstacle. Again, showing the wave fronts as well as the direction, the rays. So let's take a look at what these actually look like in real life. I'm going to head to this YouTube and we can take a look at what water waves look like just by bobbing um, a ball up and down in a pond. Okay, at first you're gonna see just a single ball bobbing up and down. And it's gonna make the ripple effects that we completely expect. But now he's gonna add a second ball bobbing up and down. So you have two sources. And take a look at the pattern that's created here. So this does happen in real life, not just our simulation. One of the coolest extensions of this is, yes, this happens in water like we just saw, but this will also happen with sound waves. So in just a minute, I'm going to show you this second YouTube video, but I kind of want to set this up for you. What's happening is there are two speakers. There's a speaker here and a speaker here. You can think of these speakers similar to like the two balls that were bobbing up and down in the water. So these two speakers are going to send out sound waves. And then what you're seeing kind of at the forefront is a skateboard right here with this phone on it. And that phone is going to um, record the intensity of the sound waves as the skateboard moves back and forth. Let's take a look. Okay, that sound that you hear is coming from the speakers. Listen close. You should be hearing a difference both in the sound that you're hearing, that sometimes it's louder, more intense, and sometimes it is quieter and less intense. It is a little bit hard to hear the difference, but you can also see it in the reading on, um, on the phone here, that it's increasing or decreasing by about 10 decibels. And so a kind of famous application of this is to go to an auditorium or a movie theater. And if we were in school, we would probably be able to set this up. But if you were able to go there and have two different speakers, let's say on either side of the, um, you know, the movie screen or something like that, as you walk along in that theater, you can hear that certain seats are actually louder and other seats are actually quieter. As you walk, you can hear these differences. They're very subtle, but they do exist. So let's try to make sense of these diffraction patterns. We're seeing that in water, sometimes the water kind of builds to be bigger or um, cancels out to be smaller. And same thing with the sound waves. Sometimes those sound waves are adding to be louder or canceling to be quieter. And this all is reminding me of a concept we've already covered of interference constructive versus destructive interference. So for example, in water waves, these would have been the peaks of the water waves. Or in terms of sound waves, these would have been the loud parts of the sound waves. And destructive interference would have been like when the water waves canceled to nothing or the sound was really quiet. Just a reminder from our previous lecture about the phase shift in terms of lambda for constructive versus destructive interference. If you have two waves that are shifted from each other by lambda or a multiple of lambda, I'm saying where n is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, then you will get constructive interference. For destructive interference, the phase shifting to line up these waves must be such 
that a trough is lining up with a crest so that those um, will cancel each other. So you want all of the half wavelengths. I'll write this as n plus 1 half times lambda, where n could be 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. So anytime you have a whole wavelength shift, you're going to get constructive interference. Anytime you have a half wavelength shift, you're going to get destructive interference. So we can start to see this constructive and destructive interference playing out with our sound waves. So here are our two speakers. I'll label them S1 and S2. And in this case, we're being shown waves that are um, both highlighting the compression and the rarefaction. I personally like to color code these waves. I'm going to color code just the compressions since that's what we usually see in wavefronts. And so anything coming from speaker two, I have made this kind of purple color. And anything coming from speaker one, I am going to make this red color. And this just kind of highlights where the waves are coming from. So I want us to zoom in on a few points here. One point would be this guy right here. And notice that we have both a compression that's purple from speaker two and a compression that is red from speaker one. This is like a trough meeting a trough. This would be constructive interference. Let's consider this point right here. Again, we have a compression meeting a compression, the purple compression from speaker two meeting the red compression from speaker one. And you again get constructive interference. In fact, all of the points highlighted in yellow are compressions meeting compressions, kind of like a trough meeting a trough, adding to be bigger and thus getting constructive interference. Even this point right in the middle, this last guy that I highlighted, this point would be a rare faction meeting a rare faction. Now this too is constructive interference. It's kind of like a trough meeting a trough. So those are still gonna add together to make an even bigger wave. So all of the highlights here are constructive interference. My question to you is, where would destructive interference be? I want you to pause the video here and take your best educated guess about destructive interference. See if you can highlight them. Checking your answers, you should have guessed that destructive interference happens every time a compression meets a rarefaction. This is kind of like um, a trough meeting a uh, crest. That would happen here, 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 and here. So I want to introduce you to a vocabulary term that's really going to help us make sense of where the constructive and destructive um, places are. We call this path length difference. This is going to be the difference in distance between a position and its two point sources. So for example, let's say I was focused in on this point right here. In order to find the path length difference, I need to take the distance away from one of the sources. I'm going to call that D2. And the distance away from the other one of the sources, I'm going to call that D1. And I would take the difference between those two points, D1 minus D2. Now I should tell you that path length difference could both be calculated like in terms of a distance, so like meters or centimeters but it could also be put in terms of wavelengths. So for example, for this point star, I could look at D1, the distance from our first speaker, as one lambda, two lambda, three lambdas. D1 could be expressed as three lambda. D2, following the purple lines, could be expressed as one lambda, two lambdas. So when we calculate our path length difference, we could say this is really three lambda minus two lambda, which gives us a path length difference of lambda. So this path length difference of lambda becomes pretty important. 
because the equations in your data booklet that we also talked about above with constructive and destructive interference are in terms of lambda. So in this example, we are talking in one times lambda for a path length difference, which puts us into constructive interference. Now, this is what we had already guessed based on our logic of a compression meeting a compression. It would make sense that this is constructive interference. But having these equations is kind of um, a helpful way of determining where constructive and destructive interference could be in terms of lambda. So let's take this idea and let's look at a slightly more complex example. So let's say that you are at a concert and there are two speakers on either side of the stage. Those speakers are going to be labeled S1 and S2. So these are your sources of sound waves. Now you have several friends scattered about. One friend is at position A, one is at position B, position C, D, E, and F. The first thing I'm going to do to help me here is I'm going to color code the waves that are coming from S1 versus the waves that are coming from S2. So I've made all of the waves from speaker number one or source one blue, and all of the waveforms from source two or speaker two are now in red. This is a technique that I often really like to use to kind of keep my waves straight. You do not have to do this, especially when you get to an IB exam, you will not have colored pencils. But for now, let's use this tool. I also want to highlight that this particular, um, this diagram is only showing the compressions or the rarefactions. So before, our diagram was kind of showing the compressions as a uh, solid line and the rarefractions as a dotted line. This is only showing one of those, so all of these in phase waves. So you could imagine that there are little dotted lines between each of these wave fronts representing the rear faction, let's say. But those are not shown here. It would get pretty complicated. So what I'd like you to do for this diagram and for each position, A, B, C, D, E, and F, I want you to figure out how many wavelengths away it is from S1. This would be counting the blue wavelengths. And similarly, the wavelengths for S2, this would be counting the red wavelengths. This is where the color coding really helps me out. Then find the path length difference by subtracting those wavelengths. Again, this will be in terms of lambda. And then determine if it's constructive or destructive. So pause the video here and see how far you can get. If you're having trouble getting started, I want to walk you through the wavelengths from S1 and S2 just for the first couple. So let's first zoom in on A, which is the point right here. I want to know first the wavelengths away from S1, so I'm going to count my blues. This would be one wavelength, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight wavelengths. That's how I came up with this answer. Next, I'm going to shift and look at how far away it is from S2. Counting just the reds, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So that's how I get eight lambda there. For B, it's a similar process. I'm first going to count the blues. Four, five, six, seven, and eight, all the way out to B. You could have also noticed that B is on the same blue wave front as A was, therefore it's the same number of wavelengths away. And then shifting my focus to red, I am one, two, three, four, five, six, and a half, because we're in between the two wave fronts. So I recorded 6.5 lambda. Fill out the rest of this table now. Your first two columns should match mine. Next up, you're calculating the path length difference, so doing one minus the other. Your differences should match my third column.
The final column is asking for constructive or destructive interference. For this, we need to remember our equations listed in our data booklet. That constructive interference always happens on a multiple of lambda, and destructive interference happens on a half multiple of lambda. So that means this would be constructive, destructive, constructive, destructive, constructive, and constructive. Don't be fooled by this last one for letter F. You do get half wavelengths, but because both of them are at a half wavelength, it's kind of like two troughs adding together. It's their path length difference that determines if it's constructive or destructive. So what does this mean? If this is a concert hall, you would want to stand here, 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 or here at A, C, E, or F. Those would be the places where you could get a really loud sound. If your friends were standing at B or D, they would hear a slightly softer concert they would hear the destructive interference effects. And if you were to repeat this process over and over for many more points than are shown here, you would start to see some patterns. Let me show you those patterns. You would see these sort of lines emerge as a pattern. For example, this red one that I just highlighted here, any point that falls along that line, for example, point K, would be constructive interference. All of the path length differences would be zero lambda from each other. Any point that would fall, let's say, along this line, such as point L, these would all be destructive interference. Their path length difference would be 0 0.5 lambda. you can start to see this pattern emerge of alternating constructive and destructive. And these patterns could help us quickly identify if something was constructive or destructive interference at that particular point. Again, notice that I've outlined the path length differences. I really wanna emphasize that it is the difference in path lengths between the two sources that helps us to understand constructive or destructive interference. I'd also like you to note if you only look at the constructive lines, meaning the red highlights here, the first one is called the primary, and then it goes to the first constructive, second constructive, and so on. And sometimes you'll see problems that say this point lies along the first constructive. And so you would need to know that that would either refer to this place on the right or this place on the left. Same thing for the blue interferences. Those are all destructive. Those go by the names first, second, and third, even though their path lengths are 0.5 lambda, 1.5 lambda, and 2.5 lambda. So just be conscious of that naming because sometimes that does come up in problems. So before we get to the GERA problem, I just want to summarize what we have covered today. We started by looking at the idea of diffraction. Diffraction being this bending around obstacles or barriers or openings. In contrast to what we've already learned, refraction and reflection. We started to look at that bending around different obstacles and slits, noticing that yes, the direction changes, but the wavelength, frequency, and speed all stay the same while the amplitude decreases. Making this note that in order to really see the diffraction, the size of the obstacle or the gap needs to be the same order of magnitude of the wavelength of the wave. We started to look at some examples involving water and sound. Thinking about an experience of being in a movie theater or an auditorium, hearing louder or quieter sounds. We started to make sense of that loudness or quietness in terms of constructive and destructive interference, which then could help us predict where loud or soft sounds would be. To mathematically make that prediction, we started to look at path length difference 
the difference in distance between a position and its two point sources. Recognizing the path length difference and these patterns as listed in our data booklet can help us make that prediction easier. Finally, we started to see patterns emerging, which brought us to our summary table, the lines of constructive interference, the lines of destructive interference. So with that in mind, let's take a look at our gear up problem. Pause the video here and solve the gear up problem and then push play to check your answer. Checking the solution here, we have a problem with two speakers that are six meters apart from each other, emitting a frequency of 686 hertz. Speakers are emitting coherent waves. And I've defined coherent here. When you hear coherent waves, you're thinking of waves that are in phase with each other, that have the same frequency, the same wave speed, by extension, the same wavelength. This is really when we get these nice interference patterns. So we know that a person is listening three meters from the first speaker and 3.5 meters from the second speaker, and we are given the speed of sound. So number one asks you to draw a diagram of the scenario. It looks something like this. In number two, I used V equals F lambda in order to find that the wavelength here of the sound waves was 0.5 meters. And then in number three, I was asked to find the path length difference, this time in meters. So I did the path length from one speaker minus the path length from another speaker, and I got a path length difference of 0 0.5 meters in number three. Now I want to compare that path length difference. I want to compare that to lambda to find out how many lambdas are in my path length difference. So I'm going to take path length difference of 0.5 meters and my lambda of 0.5 meters. And this is a pretty simple one. This comes out to be one lambda. So another way of saying path length difference is to say that it is one lambda path length difference. And once we have it in terms of lambda, it's pretty simple to apply our constructive or destructive interference rules. We know that any whole multiple of lambda is going to give us constructive interference. In this case, that must mean that it is a loud sound. Finishing up this problem, number five is asking for path length differences that would give the person the opposite interference. So that must mean destructive interference. Well, we know that destructive interference has a path length difference of n plus one half lambda. So that means it could be 0 0.5 lambda, it could be 1.5 lambda, 2.5 lambda, and so on. Since we do know lambda in this problem is 0.5, I can plug this in and solve in terms of meters. And now I have predictions where the destructive or the quiet spots would be if the person were to move there, they would have a path length difference of 0.25 meters, 0.75 meters, and 1.25 meters to experience those quiet or destructive interference spots. That's going to conclude our lecture. At this point, you should move on to the practice set.